Welcome back to the Mina Kime Show featuring Lenny, Monday Night Football Recap Edition. As always, I am joined by my friend, the host of the Dominique Foxworth Show, Dominique Foxworth, to recap the Monday Night Games, to pick some winners and woofs from the week. Dominique, uh, I have been waiting all night to talk about last night's barn burner of a game. Dolphins, Titans. You knew that was coming. Titans, Dolphins. Oh, my gosh. Take, I can get it right. Um, we will talk about that. I, you know, th- that game is more interesting to talk about sort of from a 30,000-foot view from, rather as opposed yeah. to the kind of diving in because it was an interest. It, I think it was an interesting referendum on where these teams are and where they might be going, and we will get to that. But we will, of course, start with Seahawks-Lions, which um, is a continued – a continuation of uh, a string of like just incredible Seahawks Lions games, or at least high scoring Seahawks Lions games in recent years. The Seahawks had gotten the better of the Lions um, for quite a few games, but that finally changed with Jared Goff finishing 18 for 18. Uh, absolutely flawless offensive performance by the Lions offense against the Seahawks practice squad. Just kidding. I'm not going to be bitter. Lions fans, don't get mad at me. And that sounded bitter. That sounded salty. I do want to give credit to this Lions offense. And I think Dominique, um, it's not to take away from Goff who, you know, like you do what you, you're asked to do. Right. And I thought he did right. make some very impressive throws, particularly the, the, pa- the play action pass to Jameson Williams. But what we mm-hmm. saw, I think from this Lions offense, to me, you got to talk about the offense as a whole because it was utter domination in terms of play calling, blocking the run game. Dudes were wide open. Ben Johnson was in his bag. He was calling a throwback to Goff. It, it was just, you know, a, it, the dream offensive performance for this Lions team. Yeah, it's hard to talk about the Lions without um, feeling like you're disrespecting Jared Goff. And it's hard to, like, talk about how good Jared Goff was without feeling like maybe you're going, you're getting out of hand. Like, that's the feeling I've had all day when I've been talking about it, where it's like... I, I want to praise him. He's 18 for 18 and he caught a touchdown pass and he spun out of a sack and, and zipped the ball into a tight window. And then nice. I realized, that was yeah, nice. yeah, yeah, right. I know. And then I realized that I'm starting to talk about him in the same ways that I talk about like Josh Allen or somebody like that. And I'm like, Oh guys, relax, take a deep breath. They're running the hell out of the ball. And the, there are a lot of play. I mean, I, I don't know how many of the 18 were play action. It was at least 16. Dominique. Right? He went 12 to 12 <laughs> off of play action. It was the second most yeah. uh, play action Jared Goff has used in his entire career. Continue. All right. Which like there are in play action sometimes feels like it is a way to discount the quarterbacks. Like there are play action plays. I think a Purdy where it's a lot of play action where there's still tight windows, anticipation over the middle, where it's still, you can have difficult play action execution. He didn't have a lot of that. But he executed it well, and he, I think, got the ball around. It was just a reminder, I think, to your point of how this offense, the dream of this offense is supposed to look. Yeah. Everybody got involved, like Gibbs, Montgomery, Laporta. Jameson Williams had uh, a big catch and run. Um, and St. Brown had a number of catches, threw a touchdown pass, caught a touchdown pass, and, and they were running the ball at will. This felt like their dream scenario yeah, um, come to life. And yeah, it wasn't against a great defense or a fully healthy defense, but it's an NFL defense with one of the best defensive minds in football. They picked it apart. So yeah, it, it's, I'm still in this weird limbo where it's like, I want to say Jared Goff did good no. or did great, but I, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to suggest that this offense is a Jared Goff um, machine because it's not. Well, it's one of those things where, I, I, that's why I tried to start by just praising the offense because, again, the quarterback not only did everything that was asked of him this game, he did make a couple of really impressive throws. You talked about you know, the one where he spun out of pressure, and I really – that throw to Williams, like, yes, uh, you know, he, it's, he's open. It, 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 part of the reason – it was perfectly schemed up against the Seahawks cover three. The linebacker, I think, was the, the one at fault there. But the ball placement, as it so often is the case with Jared Goff, was flawless over the middle of the field, which is how you get Jameson Williams taking off without breaking, you know, stride. Jared Goff was excellent. However, you know, like uh, of his 18 passes, one was into a tight window, (laughs) according to Next Gen Stat. Uh, Eight were into wide open, uh, which NGS defines as five yards or more, which again, the offense destroyed 
Seattle. We'll talk about the Seattle defense because that it's a little bit hard. It, it's, it's tough to parse out what happened there. I mean, or rather to parse out blame because of all the injuries, but, it, but you play the team in front of you and good teams, great teams dominate bad teams. That was a bad defense and they dominated them. And that's all you can ask for as a lions fan. Um, you know, I, but like I, 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 when I said it was the dream, I think it's kind of when you thought about, okay, what happens if this dominant offensive line, which by the way, they, they were missing their center too. So it's not mm-hmm. like they right. were entirely at full strength, but um, what happens when you have dominant offensive line, the dominant run game, a quarterback who's so good off of play action, working the middle of the field, uh, and then a true deep threat, a true burner in Williams. And then you have like, obviously Laporta and, um, uh, Almond Ross St. Brown, who can do block at yards after the catch. That's what it looks like. That's the dream. Yeah. Will it look like that against better defense? It has it looked like that against better defenses. That to me is, is the question. But I think for a Lions offense, Dominique, that has felt pretty up and down so far this season, it has to feel good to know this is what it looks like at its absolute peak. Right, yeah, to, to know that you can still, you still have that gear. Like, I'm sure the, the Eagles were, are looking at this like, oh, so so you can return to your, your past greatness. So just because you have the parts doesn't mean that it's going to work out. I guess the Eagles don't have all the parts healthy right now, but they are not that version themselves, not to change the subject. But um, I, I don't know, if we're done fawning over their offense, do you want to approach the defensive conversation or the Geno conversation? Oh. You want to do – because Geno is, is – a damn god back there it feels like he's playing some great some great 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 football but uh, that um the Lions defense that uh, hasn't turned into what they want it to yet no it hasn't i and that would be the, the the letdown for detroit because the defense looked like what they've looked like pretty a, a lot this year and wait and of course this is what they looked like last year which is uh aiden hutchinson destroying you know just going crazy up front and that's kind of it right i mean the beginning of the, the, the in the first half i did think the linebackers and Sloney and campbell made some good plays there was some good tackling carlton davis was good in coverage but then the dam broke um and again some of that was on gino who we're going to talk about in a moment just going above and beyond as he has throughout much of the season but i did come out of this game feeling like this past defense which again was missing brian branch very probably their best player back there yeah um i felt like uh, it's not fixed right i mean terry and arnold was grabbing like crazy (laughs) it killed me (laughs) i love him as a player and i think he's gonna be good in the nfl but every time he did it and then the camera would cut to him he'd be like i'd be like (laughs) you were just caught in 4k like i don't even think lions fans would dispute these calls there was a lot of calls that were disputed on both sides but you did it um and then Davis also got, you know, that was a really physical battle between him and Metcalf. But but yeah, Dominique, I, when I think about, especially after coming off the Bills-Ravens game and thinking about, okay, what's going to take to stop these teams, I do not feel particularly great about this Lions pass defense right now. Yeah, I, I'm with you in that, like, Terry and Arnold, I've, I've played with guys like this before who had all the skill and couldn't like didn't need to be handsy but couldn't break the habit because the college rules are different they couldn't yeah. break the habit and you're like you're in position we had one guy um i won't say his name but i, I play with where the coaches got so frustrated with him that they made him practice in block and boxing gloves it's like we're going to break this and i, I think honestly they were just being at this point at this point like you're not actually going to put him in the game if you're this was in season this wasn't like some training camp foolishness they were in season like you got too many penalties here are some boxing gloves, put these on. But some of those habits are hard to break when the game starts moving fast. Terry Arnold's in such great position, and I think he's got – like he has the ability, but he's going to have to break that habit. And to Carden Davis, like DK's, DK's a long day for everybody, so I'm less hard on him, but he hasn't been all that special in the previous games. But to me, it's about the pass rush more than anything. It's the, the yeah. lack thereof. Like I think that's the – these guys, I believe, in the secondary, especially when Branch is healthy, I think that they are good enough, but they're not good enough to cover all day, all game. And that's, mm. to me, the problem. They need to be rescued every now and then because they got a sack or they got some pressure. How do you feel about the Lions playing as much man coverage as they've been playing, given, in, by the way, in this game, 
Gino was much more successful against their zone than their man coverage. Um, and they, they won a lot of those reps. Do you feel like, though, given what we've seen from the secondary, it's sustainable to play as much man as they've been playing? I don't think not. See, it's not even because of what they are giving us in the secondary. It's because they can't get pressure. pressure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like man is man is hard. Man, it's hard to play man the whole game, um, especially press man, which it's going to be difficult to play if you can't get any time or if you can't get the quarterback to hurry up. And like you're going to have to have good coverage sometimes, obviously, or great coverage sometimes, and you're going to lose sometimes. But the the concept behind man is like is not we're going to shut you down or, or it's not we're going to lock you up. It's <laughs> you can't throw into tight windows enough. Like we're going to wear you down. You're not going to be able – like the windows are going to be so small, the pressure is going to get after you. And the problem yeah. is if the pressure's not there – the, the the small window doesn't matter. And when you're playing against top level receivers, sometimes the window gets bigger. I think I'm having a hard time, I think, fully um, crystallizing what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to make. But I think it's generally for football, I think about it as a holistic thing as far as pressure. Who's going to take the pressure? Who's going to take pressure off of each other? And sometimes it's offense, sometimes it's defense, sometimes it's pass rush, sometimes it's the DBs. I hardly ever see the D line, the pass rush, take the pressure off the DBs. And unless you're lining up Chant Bailey on one side and Darrell Rebus on the other side, uh, then y'all gonna have to do, you had to get, you gotta get home. I mean, it's funny because it felt like no one other than Aiden Hutchinson was really getting home or, or really affecting the game. He had 10 pressures in this game, but <laughs> the Lions had, I know, which is insane. The Lions, that's the most of any pressures of any player in any game this season, by the way. Uh, the Lions still had three times as many pressures as Seattle, uh, 18 to 6. And yeah. the fact that I think the reason why it just felt like it wasn't enough was largely because of what Geno Smith did. And that brings us to him. I mean, there was a point in the first quarter where I, I posted this. He was averaging like a 2.3 second time to throw. What he is doing behind this offensive line at times is downright heroic and and, and i before anyone gets in the mentions oh. lions fans are like you didn't golf was perfect and you're saying gino yeah i'm sorry like no, competition no. matters right like it, it, they were both great one didn't have to do much that's fine one was constantly under siege that's why we are talking about him this way quarterbacking in the it is very contextual and his context was really rough. Um, I mean, just you see, but what we saw from Dominic is what we've seen from him all this year, frankly, which is just making an extremely high degree of difficulty throws in muddy pockets. I, to me, what jumped out is something that I've mentioned this before with him. It's the playmaking. Like we think of him as this, like he's very good from the pocket. He's a pocket quarterback, uh, but I, you, you saw at times he had to extend, he had to navigate pressure, his ability to mitigate so sacks with his feet and keep plays alive is actually the thing that has impressed me the most about him over the last couple of years. Um, I'm sorry, I got hung up on, on you trying to defend yourself against some crazy fans that might think that you're being unfair. It's entirely different when you're trailing from it feels like the open and kickoff all the way to the end of the game that you're keeping. You're down two scores most of the game. They know you have to throw. There is no play action that's going to save you. And so the the yeah. Jared Goff facing very little pressure is in part because his offensive line is very good, but also in part because they were play accident and the pass rush can't pin their ears back. The Lions were in a situation most of this game where they're up by – two scores and it's like hey we got to get after him and somehow Gino kept finding ways to advance his team and keep his team competitive if it weren't for like the the um the pick penalty like there are a number of plays that could have gone the other way where we would have been talking about Gino no matter no matter how many incomplete passes he had or interceptions he threw we'd have been talking about him the same way we were talking about Jaden Daniels after last Monday night game like he was playing that well in really these circumstances and he deserves like Lions fans you got the win Gino deserves to be celebrated because even even your own head coach didn't think that Jared Goff deserved the game ball so like let's not get carried away be happy with the success don't start a lot don't start deluding yourself
you're a machine on offense when, and that, that was how I felt yeah. watching them. Just like, I mean, although, you know, um, Seattle ran the ball really well in the second half. They they abandoned it. Ryan uh-huh. Grubb, who I thought now at this point, you've got a, a track record of him um, making halftime adjustments that I think are really interesting. Uh, I, I, I didn't grab this, but I'm pretty sure the Seahawks offense has been more efficient in the second half uh, thus far this season. And that was certainly the case last night. Um, it was interesting because they were down typically two stores and then they would score and then the Lions would score and whatnot. But um he actually went back to the run as the game went on and they had more success with Kenneth Walker um, creating outside. Although some of his runs, some of them were, uh, I thought the way they used tight ends, some of them were pretty well blocked, but some of them were just pure creation. And again, you know, we talked about Gino doing work in difficult circumstances. The Lions run defense is very good. Like we were talking about the Lions pass defense being a problem. That run defense is phenomenal. They've been excellent all year. And Kenneth Walker, uh, was I thought unbelievable last night. Obviously he had the incredible play where he was like on his back and then flipped over Alex Anceloni, which is one of the funniest thing, the coolest things I've ever seen a running back. The amount of strength it takes to not go down there is insane. But um, he start, when he was running outside, he, he had, uh, outside the tackles rather, he had nine carries for 82 yards and a 52, 55% success rate. So they seem to figure out, you know, they were having struggle, tr- uh, trouble running the ball between the tackles. And thus far this season, Dominique, he is now third in rushing yards over expected per carry, which is basically how much is the running back doing behind only Derrick Henry and Saquon Barkley. There it is. That's what I was looking for. I was, I don't know. You might've saw my eyes looking around because I was trying to look that up because (laughs) you were making an argument that the Seahawks um, rushing attack was more effective in the second half, which I'm sure is accurate, but it also felt like the plays, and this is just my memory, so we could look up success rate or something else, but yeah, yeah, it felt like Kenneth Walker was making special plays. It's kind of like that um, Derrick Henry touchdown is like, hey, the Ravens got 100 yards before contact. Yeah, it's because 90 of them were in one play. So like, (laughs) it felt like a, a lot of like the the game is different than the stats in that particular case, and I could be wrong. I, I haven't looked up their success rate, but the the yards over expected is a good proxy for that. It felt like it wasn't. It felt like it was Kenneth Walker making things happen. It wasn't uh, well designed yeah. and well blocked plays in the second half. I, I just I think um, because he's been missing right, and they they were yeah. not able to run the ball at all without him consistently. And you really have seen like oh he's a he's a difference maker, and there aren't that many true difference making running backs in the NFL where you feel like they're going above and beyond the scheme. Yeah. But I, it seems undeniable that he's one of them. Um, so I came out of this game feeling very good about the Seahawks offense, honestly. Um, obviously the offensive line is a work in progress. They're mixing and matching guys and, uh, guys have been hurt the defense. However, this is the final thing I want to talk about, discuss with you in this game. It it can be hard to assess when there are many, as many players as were injured in this game, the state of things and kind of like, right. Cause on one hand they were missing yeah. every, everybody, <laughs> uh, Boya Mafe, yeah. Trenton Wostu, uh, Leonard Williams and Byron Murphy the second, who have been their best players on the front yeah. behind them, Jerome Baker, one of their starting linebackers as well. So that is obviously meaningful, especially because um, Draymond Jones, who might be the highest paid defensive lineman, just has not been very good for them at all. On the other hand, um, you know when it when it, when a offense is basically perfect, and that's what Detroit was, you have to also consider that because. You know, there were starters in there, certainly in the secondary, although it's really it's it's a lot harder to play defense when you're not getting pressure and you can't stop the run up front. So where do you land on kind of assessing what happened to this defense, which uh, pro- so far this season against bad quarterbacks had been very good? Yeah, um, I think maybe. The difference between starters and backups in NFL is minuscule and uh, as far as talent's concerned and maybe there are some other intangibles that are harder to measure but i imagine that you don't see the expectations for a defense change that much there's one player normally on a team it's the quarterback the quarterback goes down then we excuse all the problems that you had on offense 
I guess for defense, if there's a collection of players, <laughs> yeah. if there's a collection of players on defense, I guess it could have that same effect. But I really find it hard to imagine that. I think a lot of seconds, like you go all second team defense, I think they would hold up. So I, I'm not prone to give Seattle a complete pass. Like you're not supposed to just get get scored on on every drive. <laughs> I think that's I if it was like we had some key plays that hit those specific areas, I'd be like, all right, we're fine. Mm-hmm. The fact that it was from top to bottom, beginning to end, that gave me more concern than I, I think I expected to have coming out of this game. Yeah, I think you would like to have seen – some of the DBs make some more plays, but again, it, like, and this kind of goes back to what you're saying about the Lions defense. It's really hard to play coverage when like nothing yeah. is happening up front. And if the secondary is vulnerable, I do think you can run on them on the outside. And obviously Detroit did that with great success, but it's a lot easier to run on them outside when there's a little resistance up front as well. Um, you know, we'll put a pin in this. I think um, yeah. it's kind of one of those things where like, on both sides, you're, 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 it's week four. You're trying to figure out what to take from this game. Total domination, but there's some um, caveats. Um, I come out of this weirdly feeling good about both teams, which is yeah. I I the one other thing I want to say about Seattle before we move on to um, the final game, um, and this you know is just as somebody who's a little too invested in this team. I really enjoyed how Mike McDonald managed this game. Uh, it felt very different. Um, not just that he went for two down eight, which of course I, I really enjoyed, but uh, the aggression that he showed in terms of his clock management, the way he managed the end of half, even setting them up for a field goal. Uh, and then again, again, as the game went on and they were down, I, that felt different to me. It felt like, oh, this is a very, like they looked to me to be like a very well um, <clears throat> run operation, which honestly yeah, is, is a little bit of a stark departure from some recent years when it comes to the game management side of things. Um, I agree. So. I mean, since since we're talking, I want to say a little thing about coaching as it um, pertains to the Lions. Is I feel like the Lions have instituted quite a few trick plays this so far this season, and th- to me, like that trick plays always say something to me. And in this case, what I'm extrapolating from their amount of trick plays, I feel like it may have only been two or three that I've noticed them run this season. They also don't trust their defense. And it's like, that's to me, it's like, yeah, they're like, if we're going to take chance and that, I mean, that coincides with this, uh, with Campbell's aggressiveness on fourth down too, but it's also just sometimes the right move to make. But when you come into a game with fake punts and, and Philly specials and or I guess they called it Alcatraz you come into the game with these things prepared yeah. it just feels to me like you you're lacking somewhere and to me it's like we don't we don't want to give the ball back it's, it's good to know that you know right like yeah. it, I, I the thing about trick plays is people like Dan said this after um the Joe Brady one failed uh they're genius yeah. when they work you look like an idiot you don't i sorry if you have josh yeah. allen you're an idiot so yeah. i that not that yeah. I, I think brady's very good but that was bad um and it wasn't just bad because it failed it was bad because of your offense is killing them anyways right um in this game you also had ryan grubb calling a lateral on third and 16 Mwah. love that uh yeah, I, I just think both of these coaching staffs are really good, to be honest. Like, uh, yeah. both of these yeah. offensive play callers, both of these head coaches are very good. <sighs> okay, so that's uh, Lions get a bye. CX face the Giants next week. We'll see uh, which members of the defense return for that, preview the game uh, uh, later this week. Dolphins, Titans, uh, the biggest. So the Titans actually had <laughs> like 31 to 12, which I didn't, I don't know how it got. It, it just yeah. didn't feel like. Yeah. Um, both quarter, both games actually ended up being played by backup quarterbacks. The Dolphins turned to Tyler Huntley, uh, and the offensive impotence continues. Just looks like an absolute tire fire out there. The Titans, on the other hand, um, different scenario. Will Levis throws a horrible interception. The shout out to Emmanuel Agba. He tried to catch that thing with his hands. I don't know if you, he saw it, and then, <laughs> and then it fell, and then he catch it with legs. so hard with his legs. Yeah, it was. You know what? Uh, whatever it takes, big man. Uh, it didn't help that afterwards you could see Will Levis mouthing. I didn't see him. <laughs> we know, bud. Uh, so then <laughs> he goes for the first down. He gets hurt. He hurts his shoulder. 
I, uh, I'm not quite sure that it, I think it's an injury that if he was playing well, they would have kept him in the game. That's just speculation on my part, but they finally turned to Mason Rudolph. We've been waiting for this. Uh, and he doesn't light the world on fire by any means ends up going hold on. I have this eight for nine for 17, pardon me for 85 yards, but the offense does look somewhat competent. They really lean on the ground game with Tony Pollard and, uh, Tajay Spears and who's a little bit boomer bust, but they end up obviously winning in large part also because their own defense just completely nukes Miami, including on the ground. So let's start with the Titans side of this before we get to the Dolphins side. Um, this was a team that came into this game 0-3, back against the wall, new head coach, a new head coach who has been very visibly frustrated with his young quarterback. Uh, I haven't seen the commentary today. I did see he say, you know, oh, if Levis is healthy, we'll go back to, you know, the usual kind of, is it over, do you think, for Levis in Tennessee? Um, because, like I said, it's not like Rudolph came in and was amazing, but it felt like the path that they were on with Levis, it didn't feel like there was any coming back from it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the the I think you're right about the path with Levis. Like, I don't think that there's a rush to get Levis back out there. The the But, I mean, the Mason Rudolph stuff was, like – encouraging in comparison but it wasn't promising so like i don't think that that people are <laughs> over the moon about having mason rudolph out there i think more than anything day day's balling on defense that's good and so we have to all we have yeah, to celebrate yeah. is that defense i mean the defense was exceptional in this one granted are you like you know it was tyler hunley back there but they were still i, I thought my frankly i thought miami would be able to run the ball and they just choked them out in run defense i think that's what's you know coming into this year we didn't really know what to make of the titans because they do have like decent veterans on both sides mm. of the ball but uh the quarterback play offensive line play has been so such a problem for them thus far you just kind of haven't they haven't even though they've been in games um it didn't feel like there was any hope for them i guess i have mixed feelings about this because you know you're not going to win in the playoffs with Mason Rudolph, but it kind of feels like you can call it with Levis at this point, but it's been three and a chunk games. I don't know. The, the thing that's so discouraging to me that would be discouraging to me if I was a Titans fan watching this is he looks worse than last year, which is sort of a theme, right? Like I said, the same thing about Bryce Young. There, there's a lot of quarterbacks around the NFL like that, but it really, I mean, at least last year there were some – explosive play there were exciting moments including yeah. against of course the miami dolphins and it just feels oh, like this plane is is never going to get back on the tracks he just looks nervous and uncomfortable and skittish like i think that's yeah. the difference that you're speaking to because the numbers the mason rudolph numbers are not all that encouraging um but mason rudolph looks like an nfl quarterback not a great one but he looks like an nfl quarterback and i think will levis out there he looks like he doesn't belong out there like just uncomfortable and throwing ridiculous shovel passes backwards and hitting D linemen. Like and there hasn't been a week where he hasn't had like a, a, a career defining low light. It's like the, um, the Dan Orlovsky running out the back of the end zone, but he's done three plays like that, where you hit a D lineman in the chest and, and then essentially pull the Sam Darnold. I'm seeing ghosts. I didn't even see him. He had two back-to-back -back weeks where he caused his team wins because he threw ill-advised passes, just absurd passes like that. That goes along with the fact that he just looks like so uncomfortable. It's, uh, yeah. It feels like the JV quarterback got thrown into varsity and he's just terrified. Yeah, he, he doesn't. What's that you mean? No, no. I was thinking of, I saw a lot funnier and meaner tweets online that I, that were in my head while you were saying that because we were t what we were describing, he's just very memeable, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and, but yes, he, this is, I think what, what is discouraging and what would make me a little bit hesitant to go back to him or maybe willing to kind of call it. <clears throat> pardon me coming into the league pressure was an issue that was the question mark can he handle pressure and he can't right so 
it's it's not great. Um, I do think then you pivot to Tennessee. Okay, what is this season? Because if the season was about let's see what we have in Will Levis, and you're willing to call it, then the season becomes okay. What is our who are we building this team around? Do we trade DeAndre Hopkins, for example? Um, do we continue trying to add, you know, not add because you can't add this year, but do we focus on adding draft picks so we can keep building the offensive line? This is it becomes kind of forward focused. Um, I guess the, the only thing I would say about Miami is. It's a tough comp for them when you're beating, getting beat by a backup quarterback who looks competent, not great, competent, and you just haven't shown any offensive competence without Tua Tagovailoa. Like you can, Willis is the gold standard, right? But that's a much better football team than Miami. I think we agree. Like the in terms of like the, it's more quarterback friendly. The offensive line in Green Bay, I'm talking about, right? The run game, all of it. It. it but it becomes a tough look not only for um, Chris Greer, who I criticized last week, but also Mike McDaniel. If you can't get anything going offensively with a backup and then the team across the field is at least moving the ball on offense. I think I'm going to do like a little dots on, on Miami's offense for my show. And I'll give you the, the, the sneak peek of what I've come to the conclusion of. And it, it might be that Mike McDaniel might've been the perfect quarterback or the perfect coordinator for Tua, or it's that, that, that problem, he had such time to prepare for the problem that was yeah. the offensive line that he devised an offense around what Tua did well and around what their weaknesses are that fit really well. And he hasn't done that for any other quarterback. And he tried to do put Skyler and Huntley into they're running the same plays with Skyler and Huntley, which it's like actually those plays were relatively uniquely designed because of the unique situation that you had with this quarterback who has special um, I think anticipation we would give him if you're gonna say something that he has a special is like this anticipation is special. His deep deep ball accuracy has been good, but the uh, the weakness of the offensive line and the fragility of the quarterback drove um, Mike McDaniel to create this offense. And I think we assume that because he did what we thought was unthinkable, that he's some sort of offensive genius, but it's possible that he had one good idea <laughs> and and he's trying to lean on that one good idea. Or he hasn't had the time to develop around what someone does well because I saw them running the same plays and and yeah, and Tyler Huntley, Huntley right. it's not Tyler just the ones where, it's, yeah, it's not just the ones that were yeah it's not just the ones that are inaccurate but it's also when I'm rewatching the game from the coaches film like there are people open sometimes but Tyler's not comfortable with this it's not something that he does yeah. he doesn't have yeah. the relationship and the anticipation. So it's just I had the bad. same pl- thought early on. They ran like an, an inbreaker off of motion over the middle of the field that Tua Tango Valoa hits like, you know, 99 times out of 100 and it goes for a big gain and Huntley didn't, you know, throw it. Well, <coughs> pardon me. And I had a similar thought. I was thinking about like, Mike McDaniel, you were the run game coordinator in San Francisco. Like, can you get something going on the ground? But um, this offensive line is just not good. And yeah, and that's not to absolve him a blame because like you said, he had, Last week we talked about the team. You had the whole offseason. You knew to you you knew the situation with your quarterback. Um, it to me feels like a failure of both GMing and coaching watching this right now, which is like a lack of prep. Like if we're gonna you know destroy the Jets last year for not being prepared for a post Aaron Rodgers world, Miami deserves just as much criticism for what we are the product we are seeing on the field on offense. So, um, you know, get in the lab, bud, because. Right now, yeah. Levis might be the most memed quarterback, but you're becoming the most memed coach at the moment. Uh, yeah. And this is the thing about being They weren't even good before Tua got hurt. I know. Yeah. yeah, that's also a really good point. I mean, to, but I'll, I'll say, to be fair, yeah. yeah. Okay. No, this is the thing about being different in the NFL. Everybody loves it when you're winning. You attract a whole lot more attention when you're not. Uh, all right, let's take a quick break, come back, and... Uh, pick some winners and woofs for the weekend. Why should you bet with Caesars Sportsbook? Two words, Caesars Rewards. Every bet brings you closer to the types of benefits only Caesars can offer. Hotel stays, VIP experiences, sports and concert tickets, and more. It's not just an app, it's an empire. All right, we are back. Um, 
I'm going to start with my winner, the Baltimore Ravens, who put together certainly the most dominant performance we have seen uh, of the week. Uh, smashing the Buffalo Bills. I'm sure you guys, if you're listening to this, you've heard a lot about this. I think I'll just do kind of focus on a single thought. Watching them, Dominique, what struck me was how much they just controlled the game. Not only, obviously, it's a lot easier. You pull out ahead very quickly, and you're able to dictate in terms of what the Bills had to do on offense, what you're able to do defensively, all of that. But more so, um, it felt like the entire game was being played on their terms, and that their terms, the way they matched up with Buffalo on both sides of the ball, they had the advantage. Uh, I talked about this on NFL Live. <coughs> Pardon me. You know, and this is something actually we talked about in our game preview. Baltimore's ability to run the ball out of their heavy personnel matched up really well with a Bills team that was weak at linebacker that loves to defend uh, heavier packages with nickel. But I think, and I'm sure you've, you've talked about this too, what also struck me though was defensively the way they matched up with Buffalo, which is to say this Baltimore defense is very good against the run. Now, again, Buffalo fell behind, but still, they're really good against the run. That was kind of a weakness for this defense last year. Yeah. And then when the Bills had to pass, and they've been amazing throwing the ball through scheme, play action, that short to intermediate, they also matched up with them really well there, right? You got three safeties on the field who are flying around. They're super athletic. They're able to um, limit yards after the catch. And I think that's significant because more it's – seems very plausible that these teams will meet again and i'm probably going to go with baltimore because the big takeaway from this game was they just match up really well with buffalo yeah nate wiggins i thought played well which um allowed the the defense to, because that, that that was a question i think um in oh, coverage but the they don't have super elite oh yeah the corner rookie corner from clemson um there's not an elite receiver on the um buffalo bills and there, there is nobody on that team that I think um, requires game planning. Yeah. Um, and I think that plays well into the Ravens' hands because if you don't have to, one of the things that Travis Kelsey does by being there is, all right, Kyle, Kyle Hamilton, you, you got to find out where he is and we're going to put you over there. Which then means we can't do all the weird stuff we like to do with Kyle Hamilton. And – they don't have yeah. anybody on this team and I, that requires you to to address them. And that that plays right into the Ravens' hands because they have uh, – I mean, and Van Noy was rushing to pass her well. Like, there was just – yeah, it didn't feel – like to your point, they, they, the Ravens were dictating the the pace of the game on both sides and, um, and matched up well against them because there's nobody that was uh, – and it's not that they need Stefan Diggs back because I'm very high on the Bills and they're going to beat a, the beat a lot of teams this year. But a player like that changes the yeah. way that well, teams we come saw into it. the game. Devontae and, Adams yeah. took over the game against Baltimore, and yeah. there were other reasons why they lost. Oh, that that's game right. And yeah. Got but yeah, like we we yeah. saw what it does when you have like a true number one. And as much as I love this Bills offense, they are built like it's very condensed. It's very, you know, they're not really stretching the field. It comes down to, can you stop James Cook and Josh Allen for the most part? The Ravens are uniquely built to, I think, do those things, especially if you can, because like you said, Kyle Hamilton being able to play close to the line of scrimmage and just kind of wreck stuff. Um, so it's an interesting challenge for Buffalo, I think, again, if these teams meet again, because I do think that there are significant matchup problems, more so on the other side of the ball, which I kind of skipped over, but... Right. Um, I, I was really struck by the defense because I thought Buffalo's was going to make it more of a yeah. Yeah. shootout. And, and I, it was a really impressive performance from the Ravens defense. And that's just wrapping. That's the most that they felt like the Ravens. I was like, oh, this is the defense we saw last year. Because not only are you doing cool stuff with your Sims and your disguise and guys playing multiple positions, you're also hitting and flying and making <laughs> tackles. And that, I, you know, I thought for Zach Orr, that was like a big game. I feel like I'm sure this wrong this stat is wrong, but I feel like night games in Baltimore in all black, the Ravens are undefeated. It feels like that should be true. You know they, what? It's funny because yeah, all the things I, that you were talking about. Yeah, 
No, I felt the same way when they came on and, and Chris Conser and I was like, oh, they're a knight and they're wearing black. I was like, oh, what did I do? Why did I pick Buffalo? I was... <laughs> Um, okay, Commander, sorry, yeah. or, sorry, your winner is, I spoiled it. Yeah, surprise. It's actually, I'm going to change it now. Jaden Daniels in the Commanders, so take okay. that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what he did last week was exceptional. I actually feel like what he did this week was better than what he did last week. It wasn't okay. in prime time Monday night. It didn't take uh, everyone's breath away. There was no single uh, hit in the chest, deep touchdown to be the like crowning moment to make us all uh, drool over how great he is. But he, so one, doing it in back to back weeks is impressive. Doing it against a slightly better defense, I guess, is impressive. But doing it in a, a workman like I control this game from start to finish type of efficiency way with like simple scheme that's not designed to trick or confuse anybody. Uh, it's just set up. It reminds me somewhat of like uh, what Aaron Rodgers is trying to do, but Jaden Daniels is actually doing it pretty effectively. But I think part of the reason why Jaden is mm. doing it is because he has the athleticism that Aaron Rodgers yeah. no longer has. And and when something's not there, he can buy time to do it. And uh, yeah, I, I I hate it when it's the Jets because I'm thinking like, hey, scheme them up something easy. But I like it when it's Jaden because it's like, all right, I will put you in conflict. If my yes. play is not sophisticated enough to confuse you, I will use my body to put you in defensive conflict. And he hasn't made any bad decisions. They're running the shit out of the ball. It just looks – and so much so that the defense decided to show up and play a respectable game. It, it was a great week for yeah. the commanders. And and it just feels like – which is – yeah, that's why I picked the commanders and not Jaden Daniels because – No, the defense was the biggest like, surprise by far in this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was the bigger shock. And it also feels promising. Like, it's something yeah. that – I live in D.C., as you know. It's – there's, like, little teeny, like, spikes on the Richter yeah. scale of happiness. There's not – uh, a, a like terrain shifting moment like we have now where it's like oh no our floor is <laughs> is, uh, is competitive now from here until whenever as long as Jaden's healthy I mean Washington has scored on 68% of their drives which is the highest rate through four games of any team since 2000 and Daniels is completing 82 percent of his passes uh which is also a historical like a record look here's the thing um those numbers are gonna go down they're gonna play better defenses they I think they got the Ravens actually at some point and the Bears and it, yeah. the Browns next week it's gonna get harder so that uh, matters but what I'm seeing feels sustainable, not in terms of like the absurd statistics, but the way he is playing football and the way he is building on each performance. I agree. This was his best game. I don't want to be like a football hipster and say, I don't know. Some of those completions over the middle of the field were more impressive than the go ball to win the game under pressure, but they were more impressive to me because I didn't know. You know I wasn't sure. Like I I've seen him throw beautiful go balls and I'm doing the same thing I did, you know, uh, week two or three with him, but like, it feels like every week he is, he is adding more to what we have seen him do. And they, you know, I have been critical of clicking spree, but they have done a good job to your point of calling an offense where they can use the RPOs and the thread of his legs to clarify things for him, knowing that he is an extremely good decision maker. Um, so it looks great. I'm yeah, yeah it's a great story. And La you know, like, I don't believe in this defense, but I don't believe in the NFC East, man. So yeah, who the hell knows? I think anyone can win that division yeah. right now. All right. I have so much more to say, but I mean, we have other games to talk about. Yeah, we do. But All right. Gen generally, uh, well, you he's good, you exciting. I love it. You alluded to your uh, loser. Uh, so let's get hit that quickly and then we'll do mine. Oh, uh, yeah. It's the Jets. <sighs> the Jets. Nine to ten. So my big takeaway from the Jets is is everything feel well the defense is still playing pretty well but it feels like there's tension between the coach and the quarterback and i'm sure by now aaron Rodgers has probably said something that has inflamed this situation even more because it feels like he wants yeah him and jade 
Yeah, yeah. It feels like he wants some some changes. I was gonna say him and, and, and Jalen are saying things to into microphones that they know will have an impact, and he is saying things in the microphones that he knows will have an impact. Um, it's funny because in that game you saw the reason why you brought Aaron Rodgers, and you saw the risk of giving your franchise over to a forty plus man coming off an Achilles because we always said this is beautiful because their defense is so good. All you need is to be able to score like 13 points. Like all you need is um, a, a competent quarterback. That's all you need. All you, or wait. If you're in a close situation at the end of the game with Zach Wilson, you don't have a chance. You're in a close situation at the game with Aaron Rodgers, You got a chance. And he showed that. He got him into field goal range. But the problem was all the other things that were promised to us didn't happen for the rest of the game. And I know it's bad conditions, but you should not be in a one-score game, no matter how good the Broncos' defense is, with the Denver Broncos. Yes, you drove and got into field goal range, but you should not have to do that in these situations. And my criticism for their team and their offense from week one has been and this is probably all be, uh, mostly because this is what Aaron wants, but what they are running offensively is so reliant on the quarterback yeah. making the right decision and, and, and using his arm and anticipation to beat the coverage. It's not designed to give him free plays. It's the opposite of what we saw with Jared Goff, where it's like, all right, we're going to give you a couple plays. We might give you 18 plays that are wide open. There are no plays that are wide open. There's no room for error. Like Garrett Wilson has to bend in at the right time. We can't have false starts. We can't like, there's no room for error because it's all uh, relying on the players. Yeah. It it is a brand of football that is being phased out of the NFL, honestly. Right. Like they're just very few, the Bengals to some degree, there's some commonalities there with Joe Burrow. Mm -hmm. um, But for the most part, uh, this is just not where, modern football is going the thing where you sit back quarterbacks in there you wanted to Peyton Manning the defense and make perfect reads and it, it doesn't work when you don't have good you know you have one skill player is good but that connection is a little bit off and the run game has been awful for them and that's I mean that was caught in this game he had four yards on 10 attempts um thing that I and that's something I'm still trying to like kind of it's not he's running in the light box actually more than last year, but his um, his numbers are at Brees Hall. I'm talking about his numbers are down. Yeah. There's some sort of disconnect between what Aaron Rodgers wants to do in the passing attack and how Brees Hall is being set up to run the football. I think um, I don't trust Nathaniel Hackett to solve this. I think the most likely outcome is that GM Rodgers gives up the farm for Devontae Adams, who was reported today. Uh, the Raiders, uh, I was reported by, I want to make sure I cite this correctly, by the way, because, uh, uh, Vincent Bonsignor, I hope I'm saying his name right, who covers the Raiders for the Athletic, reported the Raiders are reaching out to teams. I mean, this feels like it with Rodgers, and I don't think the offense is changing, so the only way you solve this and do what you just said, which is everything has to be perfect, is you get the receiver who is perfect with him, and... I guess you pray. I don't know. That seems like it seems I would be shocked if the Jets don't pull the trigger uh, and give up more than they should for this. Yeah, well, I mean, I would be shocked if the Raiders take those assets and use them properly to build going forward. So, <laughs> all right, uh, we'll wrap quickly now. Just with my loser is the Browns. Woof, my woof is the Browns. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll be really quick here. I think what struck me it took me a second to get to this game. It was uh, that De- Deshaun Watson was not actually that bad in it. And I think that's why I- I'm giving yeah. them a woof. And that's not to say he's good or he's the answer. He's clearly no yeah. longer an elevator, right? But um, it's funny when I saw the stat line, I was like, oh, I'm sure it was another bad Watson game. And then I watched, I was like, oh, no, it's everything else. And that is why yeah. you are my woof, Cleveland. I mean, they've got obviously major injuries. Uh, on the offensive line they can't protect him mark cooper maybe he wants to be traded to the chiefs man i don't know because that was one of the worst yeah. and i like him a lot as <laughs> a player ball he, he was uh yeah. extremely bad in this game 
Um, and then the, the run defense was really bad against what had been a dismal uh, Raiders rushing attack. They're actually 20th in defensive DVOA right now, which is wild. I, I do think the defense will play better and, and get some stuff figured out. But uh, I think if you're the Browns, the whole the narrative had been like, oh, this is such a great team. If only the quarterback could play well. And this was a game where I actually thought the quarterback was not that bad, and it didn't matter. Yeah, the quarterback, I was surprised. I had the same experience as you where I saw like – clips of Deshaun Watson yelling at his offensive line and I was thinking like what are you doing you're the problem and so I went eventually got around to watching that game and was like eh, you're not that bad but you guys are still losing to the Raiders so yeah it's definitely a, a low point for this team a, a big wolf because yeah hmm. I mean the tackles are both very good and not having them is an issue but the offense just stinks man. and the defense seems whatever psychological impact they're ha that's ha being had on them because of all of the b that's happening there. Like, I feel like that's going to be hard to bounce back from too. We should do a halfway point and like, just take stock of, I mean, it feels like this year has been an example of like how hard it is to repeat elite defense year to year. Cause you got even the Pats, the Cowboys, the Browns, mm -hmm. yep. at least the Ravens are turning things Ravens around. Just all right. Showed up again. Yeah. yeah, they're back. Uh, Dominique Foxworth, always great to have you on the show. You guys can check out the Dominique Foxworth show wherever you get your pods. I'll be joining Dominique at the very end of the week to preview some of our best games. I'll be back uh, on Thursday with this show and Ben Solek to preview week five. Whoa!